Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to the March 2024 edition of the Southeast Monthly Climate Webinar, where we will talk about the climate and special topics pertaining to the Southeast region. I am Chip Conrad, uh, the director of NOAA's Southeast Regional Climate Center, and I'll be giving a climate overview of the past month. Our other speakers today are Todd Hamill from the Southeast River uh, Forecast Center, uh, who will provide a water resources update, and Pam Knox from the University of Georgia, who will provide an agricultural impacts update. And joining us today, we have Dr. Teresa Cremens, an Associate Professor of Phenology at the University of Arizona, and the Director of the USA uh, National uh, Phenology Network. And she's gonna be giving us an update on the current pollen season and what we uh, will expect in the future. So thanks for joining us. Uh, just a reminder to type your questions uh, and comments into the question box at any time, and they will be answered at the end. Also, a recap email of the webinar will be sent out with a YouTube link to this recording. All right, let's get started uh, with an overview of the climate. Okay, so uh, over the past uh, month here, you can see temperatures in the Southeast have been above normal where you see really the, uh, the yellows going all the way up to the, to the reds. Uh, some, of the, some locations in the Northern part of the Southeast were really especially warm. And this warmth also extended uh, into Puerto Rico and also highlighted there at the Virgin Islands where temperatures uh, averaged two to three uh, degrees uh, above normal. Next slide. And so just to kind of highlight this, um, the Climate Perspectives website at the Southeast Regional Climate Center shows uh, the ranks of temperatures uh, for the month to date. So that, that's up actually through yes, uh, yesterday uh, or the day before uh, March 24th. And some of, those, uh, some of those values up in the DC area are quite high. So ranks of being the fifth warmest on record. And this happens to correlate, I think, very much with the with the cherry uh, blossoms peaking there more than a week ago. So they peaked uh, on March 17th, and that was the second earliest um, date for them peaking. And the earliest peak occurred back in March 15th of 1990, and that peak was just two days before that. So, so very early peaking of that, and I think that's that's uh, correlates not only with temperatures being warm over the last month, but generally having uh, a warm a warm. Month. Next slide. Okay, so precipitation over the past month is quite variable as it typically is uh, most months of the year. Uh, we see that there were broad areas in which temperatures were, uh, or in which precipitation was um, above normal. So the greens there, uh, temperatures above normal, and then where you see the blues, and then going into sort of the dark blue purple areas there, those were, those are places where precipitation was much above normal. And what really stands out on this map more than anything is the area of parts of the outer banks of North Carolina and bits of Tidewater, Virginia. We see the blue there, uh, Cape Hatteras and Norfolk and a few other stations in the region currently have their wettest March uh, uh, going up through yesterday. And it turns out, it turns out too, they're gonna get a lot more rain here uh, over the next day and a half. So, so really a lot of rain there. Now in contrast to that, we see some areas of yellow and orange, uh, particularly portions of Florida, where precipitation is running much uh, below normal uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the area there. And then across uh, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, precipitations generally, some places above normal, other places a bit below normal, but generally speaking, precipitation, precipitation has been, been higher uh, over the last few months uh, in those areas, and that's alleviated some of the drought. Next slide. Okay, so so turning around to drought here, we can see if we compare basically the drought conditions in late uh, February. So going back about three and a half, four weeks ago, we see that there were areas of the Southeast that were in drought. Uh, what really stood out were portions of Eastern North Carolina where there was some, basically some conditions of moderate Moderate, moderate drought there indicated by the brown, abnormally dry by, by the yellow. And then if we compare that with uh, March 19th, one back about a week ago, we see those areas of drought have gotten much smaller. And now in terms of, with exception to Tennessee, we just have a bit of abnormally dry conditions uh, in Southeast portions of interior, Southeastern North Carolina, 
a very, very small area of moderate drought that you that you see there. So, so the um, if we go on here to the next slide. Okay, so looking ahead over the next seven days, uh, we got a front that's going to be passing through uh, the southeast, and some waves of low pressure are going to move along it and drop a lot of rain. There's still some uncertainty on exactly where this rain is going to fall, but you can see from the latest uh, seven-day forecast here, pretty high precipitation totals um, uh, are predicted uh, in a zone running from basically portions of the panhandle of Florida going northeast up into the coastal regions uh, of the Carolinas with upwards of three, four, and perhaps a narrow band of, of five inches of rain. Next slide. And so for Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, in terms of the drought, we can see that the drought has decreased in an area. So, so again, going back to late February, we see that broad parts of the island were abnormally dry with some areas of, of uh, D0, and then there were bits of D1. And so if we look at the, the current condition of drought there, we see that um, a real decrease in the coverage of D0, abnormally dry, and some decreased coverage there uh, of moderate drought. Next. Okay, so turning over to, you know, how trends are happening with, uh, El, with El Nino. I think as, as most of you know, we've had a, a strong El Nino uh, uh, through the winter. And so if we look at the, the forecast changes here, we have uh, El Nino advisory and La Nina watches uh, in effect. And so what we expect is a transition from El Nino to basically what we call ENSO neutral. So neutral conditions are neither El Nino nor La Nina. And that's quite likely, 83% chance uh, in the April to June uh, time period. And then there's a strong odds of a La Nina developing. And so the current forecast is that for August through September, uh, there's an, uh, it says 822%, but that's an 82.2% probability. So high probability La Nina is going to emerge. And of course, that really raises concerns right now because the sea surface temperatures um, are well above normal uh, across the Caribbean and big parts of the Atlantic. And so with the La Nina emerging, uh, that does not bode well in terms of tropical cyclones. So please stay tuned and we'll get we'll get we'll be getting more information on that. Next slide. Okay, so three-month uh, outlook uh, here across the southeast, and we see in terms of temperature, it's not really any surprise, but uh, temperatures are expected to be above normal, a uh, higher probability of above normal temperatures there indicated uh, by the orange. And in terms of precipitation, uh, there's a higher than 50% chance of above normal precipitations for, for the vast majority of the southeastern United States. And one last thing I wanted to bring up too, it's kind of interesting. Uh, we've had a lot of severe weather uh, across the Southeast uh, in January and February, but March has been, has been very quiet. And up to this date here in March, we've only had five con confirmed tornadoes. And this is less than, uh, and this is 15 less than, than, the, than the median frequency of tornadoes, which would normally be uh, at 20. So, so well above, uh, well below normal, but of course we're headed into the severe weather season. So probably we'll expect those numbers to go up. Next slide. And in, across the Caribbean, uh, temperatures uh, are predicted to, to remain well above normal. And again, but that's going to that's going to correlate with the sea surface temperatures there being uh, above normal. And precipitation anomalies are predicted to be. Uh, uh, positive, so so more precipitation than normal uh, is the forecast right now. Next slide. In terms of the drought outlook, so uh, so as I was just showing you, we just have some very small areas of abnormally dry conditions, a very very uh, small area of D1, and so they uh, uh, they expect that basically to remain or go away completely. Next slide. So looking ahead the next six to 10 days, so temperatures are expected to be um, uh, above normal, so greater than 50% probability of that, and precipitation in the six to 10 day period, uh, a slightly higher than 50% chance of, of it being uh, above normal. And maybe in a small area there in Virginia and, and a little bit of uh, Northwest North Carolina where there's a higher, somewhat higher probability of above normal precipitation. 
Next. And then the eight to 14 day period, um, the northern parts of the southeast, uh, the probabilities are that, that we're likely to have near normal uh, temperatures. And then as we go down into Florida, particularly southern Florida, there's a somewhat higher probability of above normal uh, temperatures. Precipitation, uh, very similar to the six to 10 days, there's uh, for the entire southeast greater than 50% chance of above normal precipitation. And then a bit higher than that, you, you can see there in, the, in, in much of South Carolina, Georgia, most of Alabama uh, and Florida. Next slide. And so the next three to four weeks, um, basically equal chances of above or below normal uh, temperature. Uh, and in terms of precipitation, the southern, uh, roughly the southern half of the area, there's uh, greater than a 50% chance of above normal precipitation. That's especially the case down uh, in Florida and basically equal chances of above or below normal precipitation across the northern, uh, say the northern uh, half of the region. Next. Okay, so uh, this concludes the weather and climate discussion. Uh, thank you all for your attention and, and you have here a summary uh, to look over after the webinar. And I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end and with that, I will turn it over to Todd. Thank you, Chip. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started and get rolling here. And, and you know, he, he mentioned, you know, last night we ended up having a, a good deal of rainfall on the north end of, the, of Puerto Rico. We don't typically talk about Puerto Rico a whole lot, um, but we had um, kind of a little bit unexpected, um, some, some heavy rainfall where we had some flash flooding on the north end of the island. So it, was, it ended up being a very busy, afternoon and evening for Puerto Rico and, and parts of the overnight hours. Um, but let's get back to the, the, the southeast. And so we'll start off with our stream flows. And over most of the southeast, you'll see on the left-hand graphic um, from the USGS, is that most of our, um, our streams are at normal flow or above normal flow in some places. There are a few around the Birmingham area up at the top of the Tom Bigby Basin over in um, Missis top of Mississippi, northeast Mississippi, where we're a little bit lower. And then where we where he showed a little bit of the leftover drought over in North Carolina, where we've got a little bit of, we've still got some stream flows that are pretty low. Hopefully over the next day, over the next day or two, we might um, alleviate some of that. And maybe by the next time we talk, we won't have any um, drought in the Southeast. Um, but we will see about that. So over on the right-hand side shows the kind of the 28-day duration hydrograph, and we'll we'll do the specific states um, here pretty soon. And we've been talking about this for the past few months as we had such a dry um, fall. And you can see that we quickly came out of that once we got to middle of December and into January. And this really is, and this will kind of be the theme of my talk today, is we're really at the peak of the of the flood season. So you can see that you know our lows are our you know record lows are not very low and our record highs are pretty high and so we are at the the time of the year when we see the most water in our system so even compared to average um, we are right in the middle of that and there's a mixed bag um, throughout the rest of the southeast so now let's go to the next graphic which will show each of the different states and we can talk a little bit more specifically about each of them but it'll be a very similar theme um, the Alabama forecast you can see jumped up fairly quickly. And once we've gotten into kind of a wet pattern through most of the area, we've stayed in that wet pattern. And that's true for um, certainly for Alabama, for Georgia, um, and for Florida. Now, um, one of the things um, that was mentioned um, is that we haven't had much severe weather. Well, that hasn't kept us from having plenty of rainfall, um, even if we haven't had severe weather during that time. Chip mentioned that you know we hadn't had much severe weather in March, but we have had good rainfall that's kept us pretty wet for the most part, and seen some pretty significant flooding in different parts of the Southeast. Florida's the one area where we are starting to dry out a little bit. This is, um, this is kind of their dry time of year. They don't, they don't typically expect a whole lot. They don't get as much fluctuations. <clears throat> and they'll be um, looking as they, they go down to their bottom in May to look to go back to their peak because they start their wet season sometime in late May. But this is supposed to be their dry season kind of in the middle of that right now, um, but they have seen some rainfall. We've had plenty of fronts go through. So let's go ahead and go up to the um, Eastern seaboard and look at South Carolina. 
And South Carolina has seen um, its share of rain and, and its share of flooding during this time. Um, during January, they had some pretty significant flooding. We took a little bit of a break in February, and then March has been also been wet. And that, uh, um, and I apologize, I ended up putting the same graphic in there, didn't mean to. I'll fix that before we send it out. But North Carolina, when I looked, is exactly the same. It has the exact same pattern um, that we've been seeing. And then we look at Virginia here, and um, Virginia also is in the same boat. Um, they were very wet for a while, but they have finally uh, gone back into normal. So we're pretty normal for right now. So let's go ahead and go to the next graphic. And, and this kind of talks about, um, this shows where we are as, as far as current conditions. A lot of the heavy rain that fell over the last few, you know, over the last couple of weeks has moved along to the coast. So some of these coastal areas that you've seen are seeing plenty of rainfall, uh, are, are, are seeing maybe as much rainfall, but we've had enough rain through the central parts of the states and so forth to keep those streams full, um, full of water. And so we are looking at this uh, particular event coming, um, coming up to see some more flooding. Um, and that isn't unusual. So let's go to our, our next graphic. And, um, and this will show um, kind of our typical period for high stream flows. Um, Jeff Dober, who was with us before and has done, had did some climatology work um, for us, um, he talked about across the country where we see the highest stream flows typically um, in each part of the country. And our January through April is really when um, except for the peninsula of Florida is when we see our high flows. So us seeing some flooding and everything else during this time of year is not unusual. This is when we would kind of expect it. It's different for different parts of the country for different reasons. March through May ends up being a big deal for the northern tier of the country because of snow and snow melt and so forth, although there's not a whole lot of that to worry about this year. Um, and then just as the fronts move further north, March through May ends up being very busy up in the Northeast and out West, um, whether it's a monsoon, different things out West will affect a lot of their things. And then of course, um, in the Southeast, I mentioned this before, August through uh, October is their wettest month, but wet season usually starts about June and things really start picking up. So let's look at our where we are within the, the, the week. We are in week 13, and this is our Southeast river flood climatology. And we really are finally at the peak. After this week and we start getting into April, um, we really do start to taper off the number of floods we typically get during this time. Um, this is kind of the peak of our flood season because we do start to get competition for that water in the form of, of heat and evaporation out of the soils and out of, out of lakes and so forth. And um, this is when we start to get the green up as and the trees start to using it, the evapotranspiration out of the soils. So this is when we really start to see things pick up as far as that goes and getting competition for the water. So even though we might see similar rainfall totals, not as much of it reaches the streams and gets into the ground. And so we don't see quite as much flooding, but as I meant, I've mentioned numerous times, we can expect flooding during any any week of the year. You can see even major floods can happen during any week of the year. So it's not like we're letting our guard down. We just know that we can kind of expect things to maybe slow down a little bit over the next month or two until we get to May. So let's look at Florida too real quick. And they actually had kind of the end of their peak. Most of these floods that we're seeing in here have come during El Nino years. And while we've had some rain in Florida during this time, we haven't had the, um, the excessive rain that we often can get during an El Nino year. We've seen good rain and we've seen good rain in parts and a little bit of flooding, but not what we've seen in, in past El Ninos. So I think we can be fortunate in that even when our stream flows are near normal for that area and we haven't gotten into drought. So that sets us up um, for the summer to be in good shape um, going into the summer. And that's when our wet season is and you can see that in the climatology. So let's go to our our outlook for, um, for it really, we continue to be at above normal risk for flooding. We continue to stay wet. Um, and of course, normal, as you can see, we start to taper off over the next month or so. We don't get as many floods, um, but because we're already wet, because we're still in an El Nino and still are in that kind of pattern, um, we still have the potential for, um, for having those, uh, that flooding. And so we still have an above normal chance, and that doesn't mean that Florida's out of the woods yet either. 
um, we could still get some of those fronts that push further south um, and, and affect those areas. So we continue to be, you know, at least watch those things and be careful. So we still have the above normal risk of flooding. And um, as Chip mentioned, that will evolve through the rest of the year, all depending on how, how the El Nino to La Nina develops, how the tropical season develops, and we'll get an opportunity to talk about that over the next month or two. So with that, I think I have my um, final slide and I will um, and then I will pass it off. You can see that, that's our summary and you'll see that later and we'll pass it off to Pam. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Um, it's good to be here. You will notice there's probably some background noise in the, in the background, hopefully not too bad. Um, in the last week, I've been driving across the Southeast. I've gone all the way from Western Virginia down to uh, Tallahassee, Florida, where I am now at another conference and I'm sitting in the hallway. And so it's basically gone from red bud season to red clover season. Um, and it's a good reminder that really agriculture changes a lot this time of year across uh, the region, depending on whether you're in the frost zone or not. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. So let's jump right in. Yeah, the impacts of recent conditions. Um, overall, we've had too much rain in a lot of the region, and that rain has really caused problems for farmers who are trying to get into their fields. Um, there's been delays in planting. The rain keeps the soil relatively cool as well, so that's made it a little harder for germination to occur. Uh, there is some corn planting that's going on now. Corn requires soil temperatures of about 55 degrees or warmer. Um, that really is a lot of the south part of Georgia now, and of course, Florida. Um, is ahead of us. And so um, the wet conditions have caused some problems for the seeds rotting or the young seedlings getting seedling diseases. Uh, and there's been some problems with standing water in some places as well. So I think rain is probably the single biggest issue. Soil temperatures are looking better. North Georgia certainly is not really quite to the place yet where they can plant corn. Um, we did have some colder temperatures a couple of weeks ago that was we were concerned because all the peach trees are blooming right now as well as other fruits and so we're very concerned about having another frost event like we did last year and fortunately most areas of the commercial peach production uh, region in Georgia and I think in South Carolina too did not get quite as cold and certainly not for as long so there's been limited damage seen with that. Winter grains have been doing pretty well. There's some rust showing up in some places, so they're applying fungicides. Um, and pastures have generally improved. I think they're still feeding cattle some hay, but pastures have certainly improved. And we're starting to see blooms on our satsuma uh, citrus as well. So let's go on. Soil temperature has generally been above normal for the uh, whole regions, but probably a little bit less so for the areas that are, are wet. Um, soil moisture, this is the very top of the soil. So if you look farther down, it's a little bit wetter. Um, there, you can see some drying in North Georgia and Northeast Alabama. Um, not a huge concern at this time because they have been wetter than normal over most of the winter. So I think underneath that top level, they're in a little better shape. And you can see the wet conditions in Florida as well. So if we go on. You will see the, more about this later in the in the talk this morning. The green wave has moved north. As I said, I have driven from the red bud season up in the in the western Virginia mountains down to the red clover season down in southwestern Georgia and into uh, Florida as well. Um, it's amazing to see that difference. It's, I love to see the different colors. And so we're well past uh, first leaf across the whole region and almost everywhere in the region has been earlier than normal, uh, with the exception of Central Florida there, that which was a little behind. Things have really warmed up. It's, it's not quite to first leaf yet in my home state of Michigan, but they'll be getting that soon. My mom says this forsythia is growing, so that's the first sign spring is coming. Uh, and first bloom, see now encompasses a lot of the region except for the higher elevations and also the higher latitudes. That's gonna be a little while before it gets up to Virginia, but uh, we're getting there. And so that'll be interesting to see. You're gonna hear more about this product in just a minute. So we'll move on. The March 19 frost, as I mentioned, um, this was a concern. You can see the lowest temperatures across Georgia there from our weather network. And there were quite a few areas that got near freezing. There were some frost issues, but the really cold temperatures were confined mostly to Northern Georgia. 
And so Jaymore Farms, which is up in Hall County near Gainesville in Northeast Georgia, there's a picture, all the trees were blooming. Um, they've got their strawberry fields covered there. They did pretty well. I don't think they had a whole lot of damage uh, from their frost. And so they're looking forward to a good season, assuming that we don't get any more frost, which of course is an assumption you have to think about. Blueberries also, um, most of the blueberry production in Georgia is in the Southeast. Those did not get down to freezing. And so they were in pretty good shape as well. And so I think we've, you know, hopefully navigated that. We're not out of the frost season yet, as you'll see in the next slide, but uh, we're, we're getting there. So let's go on. Here's the, the frost maps from AgroClimate. And you can see we are now in the royal blue color, the, the end of March. And so for a lot of North Georgia, North Alabama, um, most in North Carolina, sorry, it doesn't go into Virginia, um, in Western South Carolina, we're just at the average frost date. And so it would not be a surprise if we got frost after this. Um, farther, farther south, we're getting past that, but you see the last freeze at 10% can still encompass central Georgia, even some counties in southern Georgia and in northwestern uh, Florida. So we're not completely out of the woods yet. And I can remember since I moved to Georgia in 2001 that we had one frost in April. So it doesn't seem likely, but we're not out of the woods yet. So I'm sure that all the growers are keeping a close watch on those forecasts. Um, and if you're up in the mountains, uh, you've got a long way to go before you end up with even your average uh, last frost day that's coming up in mid-April. And so this is a case where it's, there's a lot of variation across the region. And because of that, there's a lot of variation in the state of agriculture. If we go on, here's my summary. I'm going to let you look at that later. And I am now happy to introduce our speaker, Teresa, who's going to be discussing one of the maps that I showed, which is the the national phenology map. So take it away. Thank you, Pam. Good morning, all. I very much appreciate uh, being invited to chat with you today. Um, I am, like Pam said, I am Teresa Kermans. I direct the USA National Phenology Network, which is a program based at the University of, of Arizona, where I am um, faculty in the School of Natural Resources and the Environment. And so given that I sit in Southern Arizona, I absolutely are appreciating hearing about the recent weather conditions that you've been experiencing there in the Southeast because it's so different. <laughs> I love hearing about um, abnormally large amounts of precipitation, which we don't experience a whole lot. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, I think pretty much we probably are, but phenology is not a term that is in our common lexicon. So. I typically like to define it as the timing of when seasonal life cycle events in plants and animals occur. So things like when we experience egg hatch in insects or in birds or other critters, or when different species of plants put on buds or open those buds, when flowers bloom, when fruits ripen, when migratory animals depart or arrive. And the reason why we bother to keep track of this kind of stuff is because it's so responsive to immediate environmental conditions. So phenology really is the, um, the embodiment of all of those conditions that you all just spent a, um, time characterizing. The fact that you know, we've had recent precipitation events combined with particular temperature events has direct influence on whether plants will flower or leaf out earlier than what we're used to experiencing or later. Um, and the same thing for animals and insects. And as well, the, when those things occur and whether it's ahead of schedule or not, has a great deal of consequences for, as, as you're all well aware, things like agricultural production, um, the risk to frost for plants like peaches that flower earlier than normal, gets increasingly greater the earlier they flower, for example. And the timing of these kinds of events also has a lot of um, ecological consequences and impacts for things like tourism and other forms of um, uh, industry. So as well, <laughs> I should also point out um, that as climate conditions have changed in recent decades and, and, um, and for over a longer period of time, we have a whole lot of evidence of the timing of these events shifting as well, and not always in the same 
directions or at the same magnitudes. And so we're starting to see the impacts um, of changing climate conditions in how our plants and animals and environments um, undergo seasonal transitions. And so for that reason, the National Phenology Network was established back in 2007. And our primary mission is to keep track of when stuff happens and share that data about that and, and more synthetic data products around with the rest of the world. One of the things that we've put a lot of effort on, though I won't spend a ton of time going into in depth today, is to coordinate a program called Nature's Notebook, which is appropriate for anybody to participate in for tracking when they are seeing uh, a seasonal activity occur in plants and animals in their yards. And so this, this program um, is, is, the core of it is, is a series of rigorous observation protocols set up such that folks that are non-experts and don't necessarily have a background in say botany can still make reports that are um, of, of sufficient rigor that they can be used in decision making and research applications. And so we've got about 1,800 different species available for monitoring in there now. Um, you can do it use, using paper data sheets that you then transcribe onto the computer, or increasingly, folks are using the mobile app. And you just basically set up a site, identify plants or animals that you want to track, and then periodically revisit that site and record what you're seeing. We have um, capacity for individuals to participate as well as groups. And so for example, we have groups of docents at nature centers or volunteers at um, biological reserves, parks or refuges, um, classrooms, um, master gardener chapters, all participating actively across the country. And we have a variety of, of tools on our website for visualizing and downloading, accessing and summarizing those data too. So if you're interested in that, please check out the website because there's an awful lot of information about this on there. And you can use it both to collect and store data for your particular application or access data that might be relevant for a question that you have in mind. And then very quickly, this is a summary of the geographic distribution and density of the observations that have come in through that program. So you can kind of see it, uh, it's um, variable across geography depending upon a whole lot of factor, factors, both population density and interest and so many more things that I don't have the time to go into right now, but is super fascinating. The other primary uh, set of products that we generate though, that are probably more relevant to, to today, today's discussion are these suites of uh, short-term forecast maps where we synthesize recent environmental conditions, primarily temperature, but also sun angle and sometimes moisture to basically predict when particular events are, are likely to occur in target species of interest. And so this is one of, I think we've got about 20 now, what we call pheno forecasts that indicate in real time whether a particular event is likely to occur. And so in this case, this is a map for emerald ash borer adults emerging because that is a point at which forest managers choose can most effectively try to control the spread of these insects because when they, when they emerge, they're about to mate and then lay their eggs and potentially spread to new trees. And so it's good to know when is that event likely to occur or is it occurring? Do we predict that it is occurring at your location so that you can get out and take action? So if that's of interest, there's a variety of those on our website as well. And so kind of along those lines and now bending toward where Pam was going, uh, we also generate an index that is intended to reflect the very beginning of biological activity in the start of spring. It has been named the leaf index. <laughs> it's a bit of a misnomer in some cases though, because not, as you're probably well aware, not all plants begin leafing out at the same time. This um, leaf index is reflective of species that begin biological activity among the earliest in the season. It is based on observations of lilacs and honeysuckles, which are shrubs that do put on their leaves earlier than many other species in, um, in, the, in the ecological communities. However, it can also be indicative of things like crocuses coming up or 
um, some of the earliest birds that become active or insects that are very active very early in the season. So I like to refer to it as just the, the very beginning, the leading edge of biological activity. And so we track this in real time and we have a short term forecast six days out that indicate where that um, where the conditions associated with that index, which is primarily temperature accumulation, um, it's a little more nuanced than that, um, has occurred. And so this, this map product shows the day of year that occurred. And then what Pam showed is the anomaly, which is how does the day of year that that index was reached today compare to the recent climate normal period, so 1991 to 2020. And so locations that are red are where that those conditions were reached earlier than average during those three full decades and the blue tones are are later than average and as pam pointed out a lot of the country did reach that um that that threshold earlier than average so far this year and what we're especially seeing in the kind of the middle of the country is the the consequences of that very warm winter and spring season that they have had up in that upper midwest upper great plains region um, it was a little more normal uh, for the very leading edge of spring in the lower tier of states. Um, and that's basically because you didn't have super warm conditions extremely early in the year, say January and, and February. To contextualize this just a little bit further, this map then says, okay, so what? <laughs> you know, we saw that big stripe of red across a lot of the middle tier of states here. And though if you we, in our visualization tool, you can actually go in and click on the pixels to get the values. And in many cases, we're not just 20 days early, but in some cases, it's even closer to 27, 28 days early in, say, Iowa and um, Nebraska. So what, though? How frequently do we see that kind of um, very early condition? Is it, is it really something to write home about or not necessarily? So this, this map really gives you that sense of variability. And so if, uh, if a location is red here, it's earlier than average, but if it's not super dark green here, what that means is that something occurs that frequently with reasonable regularity. However, if it's really dark green, then actually this is something very anomalous. And so you'll see that it's just on the very leading edge here of where we're reaching the, the conditions associated with the start of spring where it is, we, we call it the earliest on record here, that also is a little bit misleading because what we're using is the backing climate data product is the PRISM daily min-max temperature, which only goes back to um, 1981. And so it's since 1981 in these locations where it's the darkest green, this is the earliest that we've ever seen this threshold be reached. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's the earliest ever, However, we all know that we are in a period of increasing temperatures, and so it's, it's possible that it is actually the earliest we've ever experienced in our longer instrumental record. Um, and again, we're, that, that really is reflective of that very warm winter and spring that, that the whole kind of like top middle of the country experienced. And so I kind of expect that as this map creeps northward, we'll keep seeing some of that dark green there, although they did just have a, a period of cold, so that can slow things down. Um, a lot of times these maps are used to interpret um, what this means, and here are some, some meteorologists for Fox Weather using that map to try and, and say something about pollen, which is, I know, relevant for our conversation here, and I, I didn't mean to capture the, this gentleman's expression on his face in this way, but it's kind of appropriate because, in truth, the LEAP index isn't necessarily the best indicator of pollen. Um, because it's, it's really reflective of, of the very leading edge of activity in plants and animals, in plants in particular, and that's not yet when they're flowering and releasing pollen. And even though we reach conditions very early at the start of spring, if it is followed by a lot of colder temperatures, it can slow biological activity and development down, and we may not necessarily see release of pollen and flowering uh, occur early. So <laughs> this actually turned out well. So from the perspective of pollen, first of all, it's not all the plants that are flowering that are responsible for our, our, our allergies. It's the plants that are wind pollinated, which is really actually only about 10% of flowering plants. 
it's most of the gymnos firms. So the, the pines, the conifers, the cedars, that sort of thing, of course. <laughs> and you're probably very aware of that, um, especially in the Southeast. And then it is, it is um, wind pollinated trees and it's tree pollen season in the spring primarily. So uh, things like oaks and alders, elms, um, maples, uh, uh, that sort of thing, where the, the flowers are actually pretty small and pretty diminutive. And the reason for that is that that's because they're relying on the wind to disperse their pollen rather than a pollinator. So they're not bothering investing in energy and um, making pretty attractive flowers. Over the long term, what we have started to see, both in biological activity and especially pertaining to pollen too, is that the growing season is starting earlier. The growing season is lasting longer. There is more abundant pollen in the air as a consequence, both because of the longer growing season, trees are able to generate, um, they're able to start producing pollen and releasing it earlier in the year, and we're seeing an extended period during which they are releasing this pollen. And because there is increasing concentrations of CO2 in the air, to kind of oversimplify, that's like fertilizer to the plants. And so they are producing more abundant pollen. As well, some research is actually indicating that the particular plants are actually producing pollen that is more allergenic, which is really disappointing to hear. And finally, projections suggest that these trends are expected to further continue. Since 1990, on average in the US, we've seen the pollen season ex be extended by about 20 days. As well, we've, we've seen an increase in the amount of pollen in the air of about 20%. And by the end of the century, um, based on kind of the moderate climate projections, they are anticipating that the pollen season will, get ex will be extended by another 20 or so days. So I hate to be the bearer of all this bad news. Um, but the final really important bit is that we actually have really lousy monitoring of pollen here in the US. And the pollen forecasts that we have available publicly, the things like pollen.com and, and the, the maps that you see on the Weather Channel and that kind of thing are actually not based on air sampling by and large. And so they're not actually that great of, of, of forecasts and, and, and information. Most of the monitoring that we have uh, with samplers are privately managed and those data are not readily available and not available in real time. Okay, so what can we do to kind of try to answer the question about what pollen is, what's happening with pollen, even given the fact that we don't have great monitoring and very good data, real time data. Um, the NPN does have this second index that we that we distribute um, in real time, and again, six day short term forecast as well, called the Bloom Index. It is so named because it is based on the timing of flowering in those early season plants, again, mainly lilacs and honeysuckles. Um, it doesn't necessarily do a super great job at indicating when the trees that generate pollen that are responsible for our allergies are flowering, because those events happen a bit later into the season. And again, even if the season starts early, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to stay early because weather is weather and it's very variable. Um, and so right now, this is kind of the best we can do, but we need to do better, honestly. Um, this map, as again, as Pam showed, so it's about, it runs, it, it, this, this index is reached about four to six weeks later than the first index that I showed. And so it's good to be able to compare them because again, it helps illustrate um, if you saw a very early start to the season, is it remaining early because mainly uh, because of um, warm temperatures or did it stall out if you had some periods of cold or you can have the inverse, you could have a slow start and then a bunch of warmth and, and then the things start picking up. And so we really see that begin to be reflected here where you know four weeks further, four or five weeks earlier, uh, early, later into the season than that first index, we are now starting to see um, earlier th this particular kind of like checkpoint or, or a moment in, in the spring development being reached ahead or more ahead of schedule, excuse me, in the Southeast than, what, than we did with the first index. Um, and then further contextualizing that, so what? Well, it's, it's earlier than what we saw on average 1991 to 2010, or sorry, 
2020. But these onsets of this magnitude are have been seen pretty frequently, honestly, in that recent period. So it's nothing super crazy to, to write home about. Okay, can we leverage those indices to tell us something more about the abundance, the onset and the abundance of pollen in the air? This is, these are really draft results. We've been, I'm working with some folks with the um, CDC to try and summarize this. What we, what we did was gain access to some of the pollen monitoring data that do exist. There are only about 80 stations across the country that, that collect these data. Um, but we, we ask, access them and it gives you daily pollen counts. So not only you can, you can infer from that, not only when did pollen for a particular taxa begin, but also what are the dynamics of it over the season in particular, how large were the peaks and when did those peaks occur? And so we, what we've been trying to do is, I, is determine whether we can leverage the indices, the maps that I showed you previously, to then predict when particular plant taxa are likely to be releasing those, the, their pollen to then actually utilize in interpretation and, and planning for human health impacts. And so this is a map um, for mulberry pollen, which is actually a pretty bad one. Um, a lot of people have, have an allergy to that particular plant's uh, pollen. And what this map is showing is that in particular locations, we see an actually a pretty strong coherence between when that bloom index, the day of year that that bloom index is reached at that location, and then subsequently when Morris mulberry pollen is peaking. Um, and so, and in a lot of cases too, these events are are separated by a couple of weeks. And so, you know, it's, it gives you some indication of, okay, we just reached the bloom index, start taking your allergy medicine because in two weeks, if you're allergic to mulberry, it's coming. <laughs> and so that's how we're hoping to be able to leverage this. Um, and I had hoped so much that we would have this available for this spring, but we're not quite there. So for next spring, we should be able to um, take those, implement these predictions in that way. And then finally, the other thing that we're doing is trying to leverage the Nature's Notebook program, the observation program that I mentioned at the beginning, because that, that program really is eyes on the ground all across the country. And so we recently launched a campaign focused on tax plant taxes that, that are wind pollinated and generate pollen that are the most problematic for humans from an aller allergy and asthma perspective and said, yeah, and we're inviting observers, you know, really tell us when you don't see open flowers on these plants and when you do. Um, and then also if you actually see pollen, like you see in that lower left picture, you can see, you know, these are oak flowers on the bottom tier. They're pretty small. It's hard to tell when they're open, but this individual is handling the flowers and you can see, oh yes, pollen is coming out. And so if we can get those on the ground observations, this is data that we can leverage in better making predictions and then validating them in real time. So this is all work that's underway um, and aspirational in terms of having products that we can uh, you know, have available across the country and in real time. However, um, the observational data are available to anyone at any time. And so should you be interested, you are able to go in and, and query that stuff and um, get a sense of what's going on uh, and what others are saying in your area too. So the key takeaways from what we're seeing so far this, this spring, um, and especially through the lens of, of pollen, the start of the spring was not really remarkably early there in the Southeast, um, meaning it was early, but we see this, this, this amount of earliness <laughs> happen fairly regularly. However, it is three to four weeks early in, in that upper tier um, in the central US, Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. The first blooms were not early along the Gulf Coast, but they have been about one to two weeks early in Oklahoma, Arkansas, Tennessee, and North Carolina, and we're seeing that stuff creep for northward um, in real time now. The earlier spring activity generally does mean an earlier start to the pollen season, but what we really need is improved monitoring of flowering because airborne pollen is a critical and it, Sorry, airborne pollen is a critical need to improve pollen forecasts. So we need those on the ground observations to better um, be able to say something with confidence about when and where we are seeing pollen and where we're likely to see pollen. 
thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak and hopefully we have some time for questions. Teresa, thank you so much. Um, hello everyone, my name is Meredith Muth. I work at NOAA's National Integrated Drought Information System, NIDIS, and this uh, webinar series is co-organized between NIDIS, the National Weather Service, and the Southeast Regional Climate Center. Um, huge thanks to all of our guests, for Chip for standing in for Chris, Pam calling in from a conference, Todd, and of course our um, our new sp our guest speaker today, Teresa. I learned a lot about pollen that I didn't know, and it's really fascinating to see these um, these tools coming out and drawing from um, community observations. I love that. If you have any questions or comments for our speakers, please enter them into the question box. As a reminder, our webinar summary and recording will be shared with you um, via an email. It will also be posted on drought.gov. So please go ahead and share that with your networks. Our next webinar on April 23rd, we'll be talking about extreme weather. Chip mentioned that we're moving into extreme weather season in the Southeast. So learn more about tornado vulnerability. Um, and as always, we welcome your input on what topics you would like to hear about in future conversations. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start with uh, our questions and comments. Uh, first one, um, this one, Teresa, just want to shout out that we um, received a positive comment on how the phenology network has been useful in the Southeast. In particular, in 2007, it was used to determine the extent of a major Southeastern three-day freeze event, and the onset of full leaf out then was delayed by almost six weeks. So a little feedback on um, the fact that this tool and these resources have been used for quite a while now. Okay, Thank Teresa, you. this That's question. Awesome. I'm you... sorry, can I just ask for, if that individual doesn't mind following up, it's so helpful for me to know specifically how the data are, and information are used. So I'd be so, help, I, it would help me a lot to know if you're comfortable following up with me um, and just letting me, pointing me to, if that was summarized in any way, that would be awesome to hear. Thank you, thanks so much. That's great. I'll also connect you offline. Question for you, Teresa. This is um, about a specific species, cicada. Um, do you track species events such as the 13 and 17 year cicada emergence? Oh, that's an awesome question. Right now, they're not on our list. I was so thrilled to start seeing the that notification pop up on my newsfeed that those, those events were going to coincide this spring and maybe it's already happening. I don't remember exactly when it was supposed to occur. The only cicada we have on our list right now is the Apache cicada, which is the one out here in the Southwest. Um, we have the we have a process for species to be added for monitoring, um, but it's not open-ended because we're trying to ensure that um, we have a, a clear protocol for, for observing and reporting. So we're a little different than other citizen science programs in the, that way. And so, you know, the bone, the benefit of that is that hopefully it yields more usable data, but the downside is that we're not really always able to capitalize on cool things that crop up like this. And so unfortunately, no, um, at this point, no, we don't have that. <laughs> Great, thank you. Teresa, I'm really excited about this next question for you because it is linking um, some of the topics you were talking about today with uh, in, in terms of emergence and phenology, linking that to topics that we talk about every month, in particular, um, early warning of flooding, uh, river and stream flow forecasting, et cetera. So um, the River Forecast Center had a comment that they've been using climatological evapotranspiration in their real-time river modeling and forecasting. Spring and fall can be very challenging because as was stated before, soil drying rates pick up and abate and affect the scale of the forecast. So they're transitioning now to using more real-time approximations of evapotranspiration, but have used uh, the phenology depictions since they found them to be uh, subjectively tell them whether or not they're likely under over forecast runoff for spring. So that was a little bit of the backdrop and here's the question related to evapotranspiration. You mentioned 
pollination not syncing with first bloom and leaf. Can you comment on whether evapotranspiration follows similar start stops biologically? That's a lot. That's, oh my gosh. <laughs> First off, I, same comment to that individual. I would so love to hear more if you're willing to share offline about how you're using our product in, in your, your analyses. That's a new and novel one and super cool. Um, can you say the last part? I heard I heard the bit about the, the likely mismatch between pollinators and plants, but what was the, the actual question? <laughs> Sure, it's it's kind of that looking at that connection between evapotranspiration and uh, the biological start stop. So, can you comment whether evapotranspiration follows um, kind of the similar uh, blooming and leaf out? Yes. So, biologically, for sure, plants um, can can are, are responsive um, to recent conditions and and are kind of our integrators really of what that that rec those recent conditions have been um which i'm not sure if that's if that's what the question is is, is might we see kind of um oh periodic responses over the course of the season say among different species that are most active kind of along that I always think of spring as it's not a single event for sure, and it's not a point in time. It's this gradient really um, that that's, it starts basically, and it doesn't ever. It's hard to even pinpoint when it starts in the southeast if you don't have you know that hard stop of of sub freezing temperatures. It's just kind of like stuff from the fall smushes right into the spring. But yes, if you think of spring and biological activity as this kind of gradient or or um, sequence of of concurrent events that are or overlapping events that are uh, unfurling in time. Yes, I like to think of it as like based on recent conditions and so often it has much to do with temperature, but moisture availability is, is there too. Um, if it's been really warm, you'll see events that are that are poised to take place happen more quickly and rapidly and, and earlier, but then when you then have slowdowns in the conditions that are that really are um, conducive to growth and development, then, then events that are poised to occur kind of under those conditions can be delayed. And so you can see that like start, stop, slow down, speed up, slow down, speed up in that um, grading of events that occur over the period of months that, that characterize spring in response to those conditions. Um, our indices right now don't really capture all of that because we just have those two. And I tend to think of them as like slices in time and they reflect effectively they're capturing the earliest the kind of the, the early slice of spring or two early slices of spring we right now have active research to um we've got a suite of uh i think it's 10 more indices that 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 capture subsequent slices of spring so that we can kind of say something more about that um about what's happening in conditions growing conditions uh later in the spring and so we we will be unveiling a couple more of those in time for next year to kind of tell a more comprehensive story about the um how the growing season has unfolded um i hope i'm answering that question though <laughs> yeah no that, sure that, that was a fantastic answer teresa it was a mouthful um the person who provided it is going to contact you offline so you Super. guys can continue the discourse um again really excited to see hydroclimate being linked um, also in terms of prediction and, and early warning to what we're seeing on the ground biologically. So it was, a, it was a great presentation, great conversation. We are out of time right now. Again, thank you to all of you for taking time out of your schedules to joining us and to our speakers. And we look forward to um, seeing you all in April to talk about tornadoes. Thank you, have a wonderful day.